Chapter 18 Pramaya Beda Bade Tattva Veni Madhava had a wicked mind. Thus, when Brajanath scorned him, he decided to seek revenge by teaching Brajanath and the Mayapur Vaishnavas a lesson. He made a plan with some like minded friends that when Brajanath returned from Mayapur, they would surround him in a secluded place near Lakshman Hill and give him a sound thrashing. Somehow or other, Brajanath got wind of all this and consulted with Babaji. They agreed that he would come to Mayapur less frequently and then only during the day and accompanied by a bodyguard. Brajanath had some tenants in the village, amongst whom Harish was expert at stick fighting. One day, Brajanath called him and made a request. He said, Harish, I am having a little difficulty these days, but if you help me, I might have a way out. Harish said, Takor, I can lay down my life for you. I will kill your enemy today if you tell me. Rajanath replied, Veni Madhava is a wicked man, and he means to cause me some trouble. He is creating so much disturbance that I dare not to visit the Vaishnavas in Shiva Sangha. He has arranged with some of his devious friends to create trouble for me on my way home. Harish became disturbed when he heard this, and he replied, Takor, as long as there is breath in my body, you need have no fear. It looks as if this stick of mine will soon come to some good use against Veni Madhava. Just take me along with you whenever you go to Mayapur, and I will handle a hundred opponents by myself. After Brajanath had made this arrangement with Harish, he resumed his visits to Mayapur every second or fourth day, but he could not stay late. Yet he remained dissatisfied within himself when he could not discuss tattva. After some ten or twenty days had passed in this way, the wicked Veni Madhava was bitten by a snake and died. When Brajanath heard the news, he wondered, did he meet such a fate because of his envy of the Vaishnavas? Then he concluded, his allotted lifespan had finished, and so he died. Abdya Vabda Shatanteva Mrityur Vai Praninam Dhruvaha Shimad Bhagavatam 10.138 one may die today or after hundreds of years, but death is sure for every living entity. This is an eternal truth. Now my path to Shiva Sangha in Mayapur is clear. That day, Brajanath reached Shiva Sangha a little after dusk. He offered his obeisances to Raghunath Das Babaji and said, From today I will be able to come and serve your lotus feet every day, for the obstacle in the form of Veni Madhava has left this world. At first, the soft-hearted Babaji became a little disturbed on hearing about the death of this spiritually unconscious person, Anudita Vivek Jiva. Then he calmed himself and said, Swakarma Fal Buk Pumam. Everyone enjoys or suffers the result of his karma. The Jiva belongs to Krishna, and he will go wherever Krishna sends him. Anyway, Baba, I hope you have no other anxiety. Brajanath, only one, I have missed hearing your nectarian talks all these days. Today I want to hear the remaining instructions on Dashamula. Babaji, I am always available for you. Now where did we stop last time? Are there any questions in your heart after our last conversation? Brajanath, what is the name of Sri Gora Kishore's pure and invaluable philosophical teachings? The previous Acharyas have established the philosophies of Advaitavad, exclusive monism, Dvaitavad, dualism, Shuddhadvaitavad, purified non-dualism, Vishishtadvaitavad, specialized non-dualism, and Dvaitadvaitavad, dualism with monism. Has Goranga Dev accepted any of these, or has he founded a different philosophical school? When you were instructing me about the system of Sampradaya, you said that Sri Gaurangadev belongs to the Brahma Sampradaya. In that case, should we consider him to be an Acharya of Madhavacharya's Dvaitavad? Babaji Baba, you should hear the eighth shloka of Dashamula. Hare Shakte Saravam Chid Achid Akilam Syat Parinati 
vivartam no satyam shrutim, iti virudham kalimalam, hare beda bedao shruti, vihita tatvam suvimalam, tata premna siddhir, bhavati nitaram nitya vishaye. The entire spiritual and material creation is a transformation of Sri Krishna's Shakti. The impersonal philosophy of illusion, Vivartavad, is not true. It is an impurity that has been produced by Kali Yuga, and it is contrary to the teachings of the Vedas. The Vedas support Achintya Veda Ved Tattva, inconceivable oneness and difference, as the pure and absolute doctrine, and one can attain perfect love for the eternal absolute when he meets this principle. The conclusive teachings of the Upanishads are known as Vedanta, and in order to bring their precise meaning to light, Vyasadeva compiled a book of four chapters called Brahma Sutra or Vedanta Sutra. The Vedanta commands great respect amongst the intellectual class. In principle, Vedanta Sutra is widely accepted as the proper exposition of the truths taught in the Vedas. From this Vedanta Sutra, the different Acharyas extract different conclusions, which are just suitable to support their own philosophies. Sri Sankaracharya has used Vedanta Sutra to support his impersonal theory of illusion, which is called Vivartavad. He said that one compromises the very essence of Brahman if one accepts any transformation in Brahman, that the doctrine of transformation, Parinamavad, is therefore completely faulty, and that Vivartavad is the only reasonable philosophy. According to his own needs, Sri Sankaracharya collected some Vedantic mantras to support his Vivartavad, which is also known as Mayavad. We can understand from this that Parinamavad has been popular from early times, and that Sri Sankar checked its acceptance by establishing Vivartavad, which is a sectarian doctrine. Sriman Madhavacharya was dissatisfied with Vivartavad, so he propounded the doctrine of dualism, Dvaitavad, which he also supported with statements from the Vedas to suit his own purpose. Similarly, Ramanujaracharya taught specialized non-dualism, Vishishta Dvaitavad. Sri Nimbaditacharya taught dualism with monism, Dvaita Dvaitavad, and Sri Vishnu Swami taught purified non-dualism, Shuddhadvaitavad. Sri Sankaracharya's Mayavad philosophy is opposed to the basic principles of bhakti. Each of the Vaishnava Acharyas has claimed that his principles are based on bhakti, although there are differences between the various philosophies that they taught. Sriman Mahaprabhu accepted all the Vedic conclusions with due respect and gave their essence in his own instructions. Mahaprabhu taught the doctrine of Achintya Beda Ved Tattva, inconceivable difference and oneness. He remained within the Sampradaya of Sriman Madhavacharya, but still Sriman Mahaprabhu only accepted the essence of Madhavacharya's doctrine. Brajanath, what is the doctrine of Parinamvad, transformation? Babaji, there are two kinds of Parinamvad, Brahma Parinamvad, the doctrine of transformation of Brahman, and Tat Shakti Parinamvad, the teaching of the transformation of energy. Those who believe in Brahma Parinamvad, the transformation of Brahman, say that the Achintya, inconceivable, and Nirvishesh, formless Brahman, transforms itself into both living beings and the inert material energy. To support this belief, they quote from the Chandogya Upanishad 6.2.1 Ekam evadvityam Before the manifestation of this universe, there existed only the Absolute Truth, a non-dual tattva that exists in truth. According to this Vedantic mantra, Brahman is the one and only Vastu which we should accept. This theory is also known as non-dualism or Advaitavad. Look, in this theory, the word parinam, progressive transformation, is used, but the actual process that it describes is in fact vikar, destruction or deformation. 
Those who teach transformation of energy, Shakti Parinamvad, do not accept any sort of transformation in Brahman. Rather they say that the inconceivable Shakti or potency of Brahman is transformed. The Jiva Shakti portion of the potency of Brahman transforms into the individual spirit Jivas and the Maya Shakti portion transforms into the material world. According to this theory, there is Parinam, transformation, but not of Brahman. Satatvatan yata buddhiya, vikara it yudaritaha. Sadhanandas Vedanta Sara, 59. The word vikara, modification, means that something appears to be what it is factually not. Brahman is accepted as a vastu, basic substance, from which two separate products appear, namely the individual souls and this material world. The appearance of substances that are different in nature from the original substance is known as vikar, modification. What is a vikar? It is something appearing to be what it is actually not. For example, milk is transformed into yogurt. Although yogurt is milk, it is called yogurt, and this yogurt is the vikar or modification of the original substance, in this case, milk. According to Brahma Parinamvad, the material world and the jivas are the vikar of Brahman. Without any doubt, this idea is absolutely impure for the following reasons. Those who put forward this theory accept the existence of only one substance, namely the Nirvishesh Brahm. But how can this Brahman be modified into a second substance if nothing else exists apart from it? The theory itself does not allow for modification of Brahman. Accepting modification of Brahman defies logic, which is why Brahma Parinamvad is not reasonable under any circumstances. However, there is no such fault in Shakti Parinamvad, because according to this philosophy, Brahman remains unaltered at all times. Bhagavan's inconceivable Shakti that makes the impossible possible, Agatana Gatana Pratyasi Shakti, has an atomic particle which is transformed at some places as the individual souls, and it also has a shadow portion which is transformed in other places into material universes. When Brahman desired, let there be living entities, the Jiva Shakti part of the Supreme Potency, Parashakti, immediately produced innumerable souls. Similarly, when Brahman desired the existence of the material world, the Maya Potency, the shadow form of Parashakti, at once manifested the unfathomable, inanimate material world. Brahman accepts these changes while remaining free from change itself. One may argue, desiring is itself a transformation, so how can this transformation occur in the desireless Brahman? The answer to this is, you are comparing the desire of Brahman to the desire of the jiva and calling it a vikar, modification. Now, the jiva is an insignificant shakti, and whenever he desires, that desire comes from contact with another shakti. For this reason, the desire of the jiva is called vikar. However, the desire of Brahman is not in this category. The independent desire of Brahman is part of its intrinsic nature. It is one with the Shakti of Brahman, and at the same time different from it. Therefore the desire of Brahman is the Swarup of Brahman, and there is no place for Vikar. When Brahman desires, Shakti becomes active, and only Shakti is transformed. This subtle point is beyond the discriminating power of the Jiva's minute intelligence and can only be understood through the testimony of the Vedas. Now we must consider the Parinam, transformation, of Shakti. The analogy of milk changing into yogurt may not be the best example to explain Shakti Parinamvad. Material examples do not give a complete understanding of spiritual principles but they can still enlighten us regarding certain specific aspects. The Chintamani gem is a material object that can produce many varieties of jewels, but it is not transformed or deformed itself in any way. 
Sri Bhagavan's creation of this material world should be understood as being something similar to this. As soon as Bhagavan desires, his achintya shakti, inconceivable potency, creates innumerable universes of fourteen planetary systems and worlds where the jivas can live. But he himself remains absolutely unchanged. It should not be understood that this untransformed supreme is nirvishesh, formless and impersonal. On the contrary, this supreme is the great and all-encompassing substance, Brahman, Brihatvastu Brahm. He is eternally Bhagavan, the master of six opulences. If one accepts him as merely nirvishesh, one cannot explain his spiritual shakti. By his achintya shakti, he exists simultaneously in both personal and impersonal forms. To suppose that he is only nirvashesh is to accept only half the truth without full understanding. His relationship with the material world is described in the Vedas using the instrumental case to signify by which, the ablative case to signify from which, and the locative case to signify in which. It is stated in the Taittiriya Upanishad 3.1.1 Yato va imani bhutani jayante yena jatani jivanti yat prayantya bisang vishanti tad vijigya sasva tad brahma One should know that Brahman is he from whom all living beings are born, by whose power they remain alive, and into whom they enter at the end. He is the one about whom you should inquire. He is Brahman. In this shloka, Yatova Imani, the ablative case for Ishwara is used when it is said that the living beings are manifested from him. Yena, which is the instrumental case, is used when it is said that all sentient creatures live by his power. And Yat, which indicates the locative case, is used when it is said that all living beings enter into him in the end. These three symptoms show that the absolute truth is supreme. This is his unique feature. That is why Bhagavan is always Savishesh, possessing form, qualities and pastimes. Srila Jiva Goswami describes the Supreme Person in these words. Ekam eva paramatatvam svabhavika chintya saktya Sarava Daiva Svarupa Tadrupa Vaibhav Jiva Pradhan Rupena Chaturda Vatishta Te Suryanta Mandalasta Teja Iva Mandala Tad Bahir Gata Tad Rashmi Tat Pratichavi Rupena The Absolute Truth is One. His unique characteristic is that He is endowed with inconceivable potency through which he is always manifested in four ways. 1. Swarup, of his original form. 2. Tadrupa Vaibhav, as his personal splendor, including his abode and his eternal associates, expansions and avatars. 3. Jivas, as the individual spirit souls. And 4. Pradhan, as the material energy. These four features are likened to the interior of the sun planet, the surface of the sun, the sun rays emanating from this surface, and a remotely situated reflection respectively. These examples only partially explain the absolute truth. His original form is Satchit Ananda, full of eternity, knowledge and bliss, and his spiritual name, abode, associates, and the entire paraphernalia in his direct service are opulences that are non-different from himself. Swarup Vaibhava. The countless Nitya Mukta and Nitya Bada Jivas are dependent conscious atoms, Anuchit. Pradhan includes Maya Pradhan, and its products are the entire gross and subtle material worlds. These four features exist eternally, and similarly, the oneness of the Supreme Absolute is also eternal. How can these two eternal contradictions exist together? The answer is that it seems impossible to the limited intelligence of the jiva. It is only possible through Bhagavan's inconceivable energy. Vrajanath What is Vivartavad? Babaji 
There is some reference to Vivarta in the Vedas, but that is not Vivartavad. Sri Sankaracharya has interpreted the word Vivarta in such a way that Vivartavad has come to mean the same as Mayavad. The scientific meaning of the word Vivarta is Atatvatan Yata Budhya, Vivartam It Yudarita. Sadhanandas Vedanta Sara 49. Vivarta is the illusion of mistaking one thing for another. The jiva is an atomic spiritual substance, but when he is bewildered, he imagines that the subtle and gross bodies in which he is encaged are his self. This bewilderment is ignorance born of lack of knowledge, and it is the only example of Vivarta found in the Vedas. Someone may think, I am a Brahmana, Ramanath Pandey, the son of the Brahmana, Sanatan Pandey. And another may think, I am the sweeper Madhua, the son of the sweeper Harakua. But really, such thoughts are completely illusory. The jiva is an atomic spiritual spark, and is neither Ramanath Pandey nor the sweeper Madhua. It only seems to be so because he identifies with the body. The illusions of mistaking a rope for a snake or seeing silver in the reflection on a conch shell are similar examples. The Vedas use various examples to try to convince the jivas to become free from this vrivarta, the illusion of identifying oneself with his mayic body. Mayavadis reject the true conclusions of the Vedas and establish a rather comical theory of vivartavad. They say that the idea, I am Brahman, is essential understanding, and the idea, I am a jiva, is vivarta, erroneous understanding. The Vedic examples of Vivarta do not contradict Shakti Parinamvad at all, but the theory of Vivartavad that the Mayavadis put forward is simply foolish. The Mayavadis propose various types of Vivartavad, of which three are most common. 1. The soul is really Brahman, but he became bewildered into thinking himself to be an individual soul. 2. The jivas are reflections of Brahman, and three, the jivas and the material world are just the dream of Brahman. All these varieties of Vivartavad are false and contrary to Vedic evidence. Brajanath, what is this philosophy called Mayavad? I am unable to understand it. Babaji, listen carefully. Maya Shakti is just a perverted reflection of the spiritual kingdom and it is also the controller of the material world which the jiva enters when he is overpowered by ignorance and illusion. Spiritual things have an independent existence and are independently energetic, but Mayavad does not accept this. Instead, the Mayavad theory declares that the individual soul is itself Brahman and only appears to be different from Brahman because of the influence of Maya. This theory states that the jiva only thinks himself to be an individual entity and that the moment the influence of maya is removed, he understands that he is Brahman. According to this statement, while under the influence of maya, the atomic spiritual spark has no independent identity separate from maya and therefore the way of liberation for the jiva is nirvana or merging in Brahman. Mayavadis do not accept the separate existence of the pure individual soul. Furthermore, they state that Bhagavan is subordinate to Maya and has to take shelter of Maya when he needs to come to this material world. They say this is because Brahman is impersonal and does not have any form, which means that he has to assume a material, Mayic form in order to manifest himself in this world. His Ishwara aspect has a material body. The avatars accept material bodies and perform wonderful feats in this material world. In the end, they leave their material body in this world and return to their abode. Mayavadis show a little kindness towards Bhagavan, for they accept some differences between the jiva and the avatars of Ishwara. The distinction they make is that the jiva has to accept a gross body because of his past karma. This karma carries him away even against his wishes and he is forced to accept birth, old age and death. 
The Mayavadis say that Ishwara's body, designation, name and qualities are also material, but that he accepts them of his own accord, and that whenever he desires, he can reject everything and regain his pure spirituality. He is not forced to accept the reactions resulting from the activities that he performs. These are all misconceptions of the Mayavadis. Brajanath, is this Mayavad philosophy found anywhere in the Vedas? Babaji, no, Mayavad cannot be found anywhere in the Vedas. Mayavad is Buddhism. We read in Padma Purana, Uttara Kanda 43.6. Maya vadam asach chastram, prachchanam bodam uchyate, mayaiva vihitam devi, kalau brahmana murtina. In answer to a question by Uma Devi, Parvati, Mahadev explains, O Devi, Mayavad is an impure shastra. Although actually covered Buddhism, it has gained entry into the religion of the Aryans, disguised as Vedic conclusions. In Kali Yuga, I shall appear in the guise of a Brahmana and preach this Mayavad philosophy. Brajanath, Prabhu, why did Mahadev perform such an ugly task when he is the leader of the Devatas and the foremost among Vaishnavas? Babaji, Sri Mahadev is Bhagavan's Guna avatar. The supremely merciful Lord saw the Asuras taking to the path of Bhakti and worshipping him to get fruitive results and to fulfill their wicked desires. He then thought, The Asuras are troubling the devotees by polluting the path of devotional service, but the path of bhakti should be freed from this pollution. Thinking thus, he called for Shivji and said, O Shambhu, it is not auspicious for this material world if my pure bhakti is taught amongst those who are in the mode of ignorance or whose character is Asuric. You should preach from Shastra and spread Mayavad philosophy in such a way that the Asuras become enamored and I remain concealed from them. Those whose character is Asuric will leave the path of devotional service and take shelter of Mayavad, and this will give my gentle bhaktas the chance to taste pure devotional service unhindered. Sri Mahadev, who is the supreme Vaishnava, was at first somewhat reluctant to accept such an arduous task with which Bhagavan had entrusted him. However, considering this to be his order, he therefore preached the Mayavad philosophy. Where is the fault of Sriman Mahadev, the supreme guru, in this? The entire universe functions smoothly like a well-oiled machine under the guidance of Bhagavan, who expertly wields in his hand the splendid Sudarshan Chakra, for the well-being of all creatures. Only he knows what auspiciousness is hidden in his order, and the duty of his humble servants is simply to obey his order. Knowing this, the pure Vaishnavas never find any fault in Sankaracharya, Shiva's incarnation, who preached Mayavad. Listen to the evidence from Shastra for this. Tvam aradya tata shambho, grahistyami varam sada. Padma Purana, Uttara Kanda, 42.109.110 Vishnu said, O Shambhu, although I am Bhagavan, still I have worshipped different devatas and devas to bewilder the asuras. In the same way, I shall worship you as well and receive a benediction. In Kali Yuga, you should incarnate amongst human beings through your partial expansion. You should preach from Shastra like Agama, and fabricate a philosophy that will distract the general mass of people away from me and keep me covered. In this way, more and more people will be diverted away from me, and my pastimes will become all the more valuable. In Varaha Purana, Bhagavan tells Shiva, Esha Mohang Srijam Yashu. I am creating a kind of illusion, Moha, that will delude the mass of people. O strong armed Rudra, you also create such a deluding Shastra. O mighty armed one, present fact as falsehood, and falsehood as fact. Give prominence to your destructive Rudra form, and conceal my eternal original form as Bhagavan. Brajanath, is there any Vedic evidence against the Mayavad philosophy? Babaji, 
all the testimony of the Vedas refutes Mayavad philosophy. The Mayavadis have searched all the Vedas and isolated four sentences in their support. They call these four sentences Mahavakya, the illustrious statements. These four statements are 1. Saravam Kalvidam Brahma All the universe is Brahman. Chandogya Upanishad 3.14.1 2. Pragyanam Brahma The supreme knowledge is Brahman. Aitariya Upanishad 1.5.3 3. Tattvam Asi Svetaketo O Svetaketo, you are that. Chandogya Upanishad 6.8.7 and 4. Aham Brahmasmi I am Brahman. Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad 1.4.10 The first Mahavakya teaches that the whole universe consisting of the living beings and non-living matter is Brahman. Nothing exists that is not Brahman. The identity of that Brahman is explained elsewhere. Natasya karyam karanam cha vidyate, natat samas cha byadikas cha drisyate, parasya shaktiya vividaiva suryate, svabhavaki jnana balakriya cha. Shvetashvatara Upanishad 6.8 None of the activities of that parabrahm paramatma is mundane, because none of his senses, such as his hands and legs, are material. Thus, through the medium of his transcendental body, he performs his pastimes without any material senses, and he is present everywhere at the same time. Therefore, no one is even equal to him, what to speak of being greater than him. The one divine potency of Parameshwara has been described in Shruti in many ways, among which the description of his Gyan Shakti, knowledge, his Bala Shakti, power, and his Kriya Shakti, potency for activity, are most important. These are also called Chit Shakti or Samvit Shakti, Sat Shakti or Sandini Shakti, and Ananda Shakti or Khladini Shakti respectively. Brahman and his Shakti are accepted as non-different from each other. In fact, this Shakti is said to be an inherent part of Brahman, which is manifested in different ways. From one point of view, it may be said that nothing is different from Brahman, for the potency and the possessor of potency are non-different. However, when we look at the material world, we see that in another sense Brahman and his Shakti are certainly different. Nityo nityanam chaitanash chaitananam Eko bahunam yo vididati kaman Kata Upanishad 2.13 and Shvetashvatara Upanishad 6.10 he is the one supreme eternal being among all eternal beings, and the one supreme conscious being among all conscious beings. He alone is fulfilling the desires of everyone. This statement from the Vedas accepts variegatedness within the eternally existing substance, Brahman. It separates the Shakti, potency, from Shakti Man, the possessor of the potency, and then it considers his Gyan, knowledge, Bala, power, and Kriya activities. Now let us consider the second Mahavakya, Pragyanam Brahman. The supreme knowledge is Brahman. Aitariya Upanishad 153. There it is said that Brahman and consciousness are identical. The word Pragyanam, which in this sentence is said to be one with Brahman, is also used in Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad 4421 where it is used to mean prema bhakti tam eva diro vigyaya pragyamam kurvita brahmanaha when a steady and sober person attains knowledge of brahman he worships him with genuine loving feelings gyan swarup prema bhakti the third mahavakya is tattvam asi shvetaketu o shvetaketu you are that Chandyogya Upanishad 687 This shloka gives instruction on oneness with Brahman, which is more elaborately described in the Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad 6810 as follows. 
Yuva etad aksharam, gargya vidit vasmal, lokat praiti sakripana, ya etad aksharam gargi, vidit vasmal lokat praiti, sa brahmanaha. O gargi, those who leave this material world without understanding the eternal Vishnu are kripana, extremely miserly or degraded. Whereas those who leave this material world in knowledge of that Supreme Eternal are actually Brahmanas, knowers of Brahman. The words tat dvam asi therefore mean, he who gains true knowledge eventually attains devotional service to Parabrahma, and he is known as a Brahmana. The fourth Mahavakya is Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad 1.4.10. If the vidya that is established in this vakya does not become bhakti in the end, then it is thoroughly condemned in Sri Ishopanishad 9, which says, Andam tamaha pravishanti ye vidyam upasate tato buya ivate tamo ya u vidyayang rataha. Those who are situated in ignorance enter deep darkness, and those who are in knowledge enter deeper darkness still. This mantra means that those who embrace ignorance and do not know the spiritual nature of the soul enter the darkest regions of ignorance. However, the destination of those who reject ignorance but who believe that the jiva is Brahman and not a spiritual atom is far worse. Baba, the Vedas have no shoreline and are unsurpassed. Their precise meaning can only be understood by studying each and every shloka of the Upanishads separately, and by deriving the meaning from all of them combined. If one singles out a particular sentence, he may always be diverted by some misinterpretation. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu therefore investigated all the Vedas thoroughly, and then preached that the individual spirit souls and the material world are simultaneously and inconceivably one with Sri Hari and different from him. Brajanath, I understand that the Vedas establish the teaching of Achintya Beda Bay Tattva. Will you please explain this more clearly with proofs from the Vedas themselves? Babaji, here are some of the many passages that describe the oneness aspect of Beda Tattva of Beda Bay Tattva. Saravam Kalvidam Brahma. Everything in this world is certainly Brahman. Chandogya Upanishad. 3.14.1 At my Vedam Sarvam Iti Everything that is visible is spirit, Atma. Chandogya Upanishad 7.52.2 Sad eva som yedam agra asid ekam eva dvitiyam O gentle one, this world initially existed in a non-dual spiritual form, and before the manifestation of this universe, the Supreme Spirit was just a non-dual substance. Chandogya Upanishad 6.2.1 Evang sa devo bhagavan varen yo yoni svabhavan adidista tyekaha Bhagavan himself is the master of all, even of the devatas, and he is the only one who is worthy of worship. He is the cause of all causes, but he himself remains unaltered, just as the sun remains stationary while spreading its radiance in all directions. Shweteshvatara Upanishad 5.4 Now listen to the mantras that support Beda, difference. Om Brahma Vid Apnoti Param One who understands Brahman attains the Parabrahma. Taitariya Upanishad 2.1 Mahantang Vibhum Atmanam Matva diro na sochati. A sober, intelligent person does not lament, even on seeing a soul in a material body, because he knows that the soul is great and present everywhere. Kata Upanishad 1 2 22. Satyam jnanam anantang brahma yo veda nihitam. Brahma is truth, knowledge, and eternity personified. That Brahma is situated in the spiritual sky, Paravyoma, 
and is also present in the depth of all living entities' hearts. One who knows this attains Siddhi through his relationship with that indwelling supersoul, Antaryami, the omniscient Brahma. First Anucheda, Taitariya Brahmananda Vali. Yasmat param na param asti kinchit. There is no truth superior to that supreme person. He is smaller than the smallest and greater than the greatest. He stands alone, immovable like a tree in his self-effulgent abode. This entire universe rests within that one supreme person. Shvateshvatara Upanishad 3.9 Pradana Chaitragya Patiya Gunesha The Parabrahma is the lord of the unmanifested material nature, Pradhan, the master of that Paramatma who knows all the individual living entities and the Ishwara of the three modes of material nature. He is himself transcendental to the modes of material nature. Shvateshvatara Upanishad 6.16 Tasyaisa Atma Vivrunute Tunam Swam He reveals his body only to those people in a very particular way. Kata Upanishad 2.23 Tam Ahur Agriyam Purusham Mahantam Those who know the absolute truth chant his glories, knowing him to be Mahan Adi Purush, the great personality and the cause of all causes. Shvateshvatara Upanishad 3.19 Yatar Tatar Tyortan Vyadadat By his inconceivable potency, he maintains the separate identities of all the eternal elements, along with their particular attributes. Isopanishad Mantra 8 Naitad Ashakam Vignatam Yad Etad Yakshang Iti. Agnidev, the Devata of Fire, said to the assembled Devatas, I cannot fully comprehend the identity of this Yaksha. Kena Upanishad 3 6. Asadva Idam Agra Asit. In the beginning, this universe was just an unmanifested form of Brahma. This unmanifest became manifest in the form of Brahma. That Brahma manifested himself in a male form. For this reason, that male form is known as the Creator. Taittiriya Upanishad 2.7.1 Nityo Nityanam Who is the Supreme Eternal Being among all the eternal beings? Kata Upanishad 2.13 and Shvetashvatara Upanishad 6.13 Saravam Hyetad Brahmayam Atma Brahma Soyam Atma Chatushpat All this is a manifestation of the inferior potency of Brahma. The spiritual form of Krishna is none other than the Parabrahma. By his inconceivable potency, he eternally manifests himself in four nectarian forms, even though he is one. Mundaka Upanishad Mantra 2 I am Atma Sarvesham Bhutanam Madhu. The Vedas speak about Krishna in an indirect way by describing his attributes, and here they say, Among all living beings, it is only Krishna himself who is sweet like nectar. Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad 2.5.14 In these and countless other passages, the Vedas declare that the individual souls are eternally different from the Supreme. Every part of the Vedas is wonderful, and no portion of them can be neglected. It is true that the individual jivas are eternally different from the Supreme, and it is also true that they are eternally non-different from the Supreme. We can find evidence in the Vedas to support both Beda, difference, and Abeda, non-difference because Beda and Abeda exist simultaneously as aspects of the Absolute Truth. This relationship of the Jivas with the Supreme, as simultaneously one with Him and different from Him, is inconceivable and beyond mundane intelligence. Logic and arguments about the matter only lead to confusion. Whatever has been said in the various parts of the Vedas is all true, but we cannot understand the complete meaning of those words because our intelligence is very limited.
That is why we should never disregard Vedic teachings. Naisha Tarkena Matir Apaneya Kata Upanishad 2.2 Nichiketa It is not proper to use argument to destroy the wisdom of the absolute truth that you have received. Nahamma nye su vedeti No na vedeti veda cha Kena Upanishad 2.2 I do not think that I have thoroughly understood Brahma. These Vedic mantras give clear instructions that the Shakti of Ishwara is inconceivable and hence beyond mundane reasoning. Mahabharat says, Puranam manavo dharma sangavedam chikitsitam agyasidani chatvari na hantavyami he tupihi The Sattvata Puranas, the Dharma instructed by Manu, the Sad Anga Veda and Chikitsa Shastra are the authentic orders of the Supreme, and it is improper to try to refute them by mundane arguments. Thus it is quite clear that the Vedas support the Achintya Veda Ved Tattva. Bearing in mind the ultimate goal of the Jiva, it seems that there is no Siddhanta that is higher than the principle of Achintya Veda Ved Tattva. In fact, no other Siddhanta even seems true. Only when one accepts this philosophy of Achintya Beda Bed can one realize the eternal individuality of the Jiva and his eternal difference from Sri Hari. Without understanding this difference, the individual soul cannot attain the true goal of life, which is Priti, love for the Supreme. Brajanath, what is the evidence that Priti is the ultimate goal for the Jiva? Babaji, it is said in the Vedas, Prano Yeshaya Saravabutera Vibhati Mundaka Upanishad 3.14 The Supreme Person is the life of all that lives, and He shines within all beings. Those who know that Supreme Personality by the science of Bhakti do not look for anything else. No topic other than the glories of Sri Krishna holds any further interest for those who are liberated beings, Jivan Mukta. Such Jivan Muktas are endowed with attachment for the Supreme, Rati, and they participate in his loving pastimes. Such bhaktas are the best of all those who are in knowledge of Brahma. In other words, the most fortunate of those who know Brahma associate with Krishna actively in his loving pastimes. This sentiment of Rati is a symptom of love for Krishna. It is explained further in the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad 245 and 456. Nava are saravasya, karmaya saravang priyang, bhavat yatmanas to karmaya, saravang priyang bhavati. Yagya Valkya said, O my tree, everyone is not dear to us because of their necessities, rather they are dear to us because of our own necessities. It is evident from this mantra that priti, love for the supreme, is the only prayogen for the jiva. Baba, there are many examples of such statements in the Vedas. Raso Vaisaha Kohye Vanyat Kaha Pranyat Yad Esha Akasha Anando Nasyat Esha Hyevan Andayati Srimad Bhagavatam and Taitariya Upanishad 271 The Para Brahma, Paramatma, is nectar personified. The Jiva finds pleasure in associating with that nectarian Paramatma and who could live if he was not present in the heart? It is Paramatma alone who gives bliss to the jivas. The word Ananda, bliss, is a synonym for priti, affection. All living beings are in search of pleasure and bliss. A Mamukshu believes that liberation is the ultimate pleasure, and that is why he is mad for liberation. The sense enjoyers, Bubukshus, believe that the objects of sense gratification are the ultimate pleasure, so they pursue the objects of sense gratification until the end of their lives. It is the hope of achieving pleasure that induces everyone to perform all his activities. The bhaktas are also endeavoring for Sri Krishna's devotional service. In fact, everyone is looking for priti, so much so that they are even ready to sacrifice their lives for it. In principle, Everyone's ultimate aim is priti, 
and no one can disagree with this. Everyone is exclusively searching for pleasure, whether they are believers or atheists, fruitive workers, kamis, jnanis, and whether they have desires or are desireless. However, one cannot achieve puriti simply by seeking it. The fruitive workers believe that celestial pleasures are the ultimate bliss, but it is explained in Bhagavad Gita 9.20. Kshine punye martya lokan vishanti. After the residents of the gigantic celestial planets have completed the results of their good karma, they have to take birth again on the mortal earthly planets. The kamis who desire sense gratification constantly transmigrate from one planet to another in this way. According to this shloka of Gita, everyone realizes their mistake only when they fall from the celestial planets. A person may begin to covet the pleasures of the heavenly planets again when he fails to find pleasure in the wealth, children, fame, and power that is available in the world of human beings. However, while he is falling from the celestial worlds, he adopts a respectful attitude towards an even greater happiness than that of Swarga, the heavenly planets. He becomes indifferent to the pleasures of the human worlds, the celestial planets, and even the higher planets up to Brahmaloka when he understands that they are all temporary and that their happiness is also not fixed or eternal. He then becomes renounced and starts to investigate Brahma Nirvana and endeavor earnestly for impersonal liberation. However, when he sees that impersonal liberation also lacks bliss, he takes an unbiased Tatashta position and searches for another path that will enable him to achieve Pariti or pleasure. How is it possible to experience pretty in impersonal liberation? Who is the personality who is supposed to experience such bliss? If I lose my identity, who will exist to experience Brahma? The very concept of the bliss of Brahman is meaningless because whether there is pleasure in Brahman or not, the theory of impersonal liberation does not admit that anyone actually exists in the liberated state to enjoy such pleasure. So what conclusion can be drawn from such a doctrine? If I cease to exist when I am liberated, then my individuality is lost along with my existence. Nothing pertains to me anymore by which I can experience bliss or pleasure. Nothing exists for me if I myself do not exist. Someone may say, I am Brahma Rupa. However, this statement is false, because the I, who is Brahma Rupa, is Nitya, eternal. In other words, if one says that he is Brahman, then he is also eternal. In that case, everything is useless for him, including the process to attain perfection, sadhan, and perfection itself, siddhi. Therefore, priti is not to be obtained in Brahman Nirvana. Even if it is perfect, it is something that is not experienced like a flower growing in the sky. Bhakti is the only path by which the jiva can attain his true goal. The final stage of bhakti is prem, which is eternal. The pure jiva is eternal, pure Krishna is eternal, and pure love for him is also eternal. Consequently, one can only attain the perfection of true love in eternity when he accepts the truth of a chintya beda beda. Otherwise, the ultimate goal of the jiva, which is love for the supreme, becomes non-eternal, and the existence of the jiva is also lost. Therefore, all the shastras accept and confirm the doctrine of achintya beda beda. All other doctrines are simply speculation. Brajanath returned home in a blissful state of mind, deeply absorbed in thoughts about pure spiritual love. Thus ends the 18th chapter of Jaiva Dharma, entitled Prameya, Beda Bed Tattva.